get started. My name is Kristen Davis and I am the editor in chief of the Government Law Review. And today we'll be presenting remedying redlining. So today's presentation will consist of a keynote speaker followed by a 10 minute break, followed by a panel discussion. We're very excited. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background about the Government Law Review, it's a student edited journal here at Albany Law School uh, that focuses primarily on government law and government affairs. We're partnering with the Government Law Center to bring you this event today. We wanted to focus on something that was close to the Albany area, and we were inspired by uh, the color of law. A lot of our students had read that last year, so we wanted to focus our symposium on housing. And we are lucky enough that the author of that book, Mr. Richard Rothstein, is going to be our keynote speaker today. Uh, we are honored. He is the Distinguished Fellow at the Economic Policy Institute and a Senior Fellow Emeritus at the Thurgood Marshall Institute of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. He is the author of The Color of Law and many other books on racial justice, education, and housing. And he is now working on a new book about what local supporters of racial justice can do to redress racial segregation. And this is going to be published in the fall of 2023, so look out for, those, for that. Um, Audience members are going to have the opportunity to ask questions to Mr. Rothstein towards the end of his presentation. So if you're interested in asking a question virtually, you can put it directly in the chat. If you want to ask a question in person, we have note cards at the front, you can hand them to us. And then Connor Judd, who will, who will come up later, will read those out. And before we start, I just wanna thank everyone, especially Connor Judd, our managing editor for business and symposium for putting together this event. Um, without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. Go ahead whenever you're ready, Mr. Rothstein. Well, thank you very much. Thanks to all of you for engaging with me in this conversation today. Let me begin by uh, saying that, as you all know, in the 20th century, we had a civil rights movement in this country. It began by challenging segregation in law schools. Uh, and then went on to challenge segregation in colleges and universities. And then in 1954, as you all know, it persuaded the uh, Supreme Court to um, prohibit ongoing segregation of elementary and secondary schools, legal segregation of elementary and secondary schools. And that the uh, Brown versus Board of Education gave impetus, the stimulus, inspiration, to a movement of activists. They engaged in marches, demonstrations, civil disobedience. People lost their lives in that struggle. Uh, many were injured. Uh, but by the end of the 1960s, we pre pretty much persuaded much of the country, not everybody, but much of the country, that racial segregation was wrong, that it was immoral, that it was harmful to both African-Americans and to whites, that it was incompatible with our self-conception as a constitutional democracy. Uh, with that understanding, we succeeded in uh, abolishing segregation of public accommodations, public transportation, uh, employment. And then in 1968, in the wake of the assassination of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., we prohibited ongoing segregation, ongoing discrimination, I'm sorry, ongoing discrimination in the sale and rental of housing. But then the civil rights movement pretty much ended and left untouched the biggest segregation of all, which is that every metropolitan area in this country is residentially segregated. I've lived in many of them. Every one that I've lived in had clearly defined areas that were all white or mostly white, clearly defined areas that are either all black or mostly black. How could it be? If we came to understand that racial segregation was wrong, immoral, harmful to both blacks and whites, incompatible with our self-conception as a constitutional democracy, how could it be that we left untouched the biggest segregation of all? We remain an apartheid society when it comes to neighborhoods. Well, I guess partly you can say that it's because it's so hard to undo residential segregation once we've established it. After all, if we prohibit the segregation in restaurants, the next day, you can go to any restaurant you want, sit anywhere you want in that restaurant. 
but if we prohibit uh, uh, segregation in neighborhoods, the next day uh, things wouldn't look much different. I'm sorry. I, uh, what's going on? I, can you hear me? Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, uh, Mr. Rossi. I think okay. that was uh, someone must have just joined and they had their mute off. Uh, but if everyone, all the panelists could please have your uh, microphone muted, we appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, what I was saying is if we prohibit segregation in restaurants or schools or colleges or buses, the next day you can go to any restaurant, you can apply to any college, uh, you can uh, ride on any bus. But if we prohibit uh, segregation in neighborhoods, the next day things wouldn't look much different. Uh, so what we've done, all of us, and I mean all of us, blacks, whites, liberals, conservatives, northerners, southerners, is we've adopted a national rationalization, an excuse we give ourselves for refusing to uh, redress or failing to redress the biggest segregation of all. And that excuse goes something like this. We tell ourselves that the segregation of public accommodations or transportation, schools, colleges, that was all done by government. If the federal government was um, doing it, that was a violation of the Fifth Amendment. If state and local governments were doing it, it was a violation of the 14th Amendment. Every one of these civil rights violations requires a remedy. But residential segregation, we tell ourselves, that's something entirely different. That wasn't done by government. It wasn't done by law, by regulation, by public policy, by ordinance. That just happened naturally. It happened because Oh, bigoted white homeowners or landlords wouldn't sell or rent to African Americans in uh, predominantly white neighborhoods. Maybe it happened because uh, private businesses, banks, realtors, developers uh, refused to um, uh, build or create uh, housing uh, that would be integrated. They discriminated in their private activities. Or maybe we tell ourselves it's just because blacks and whites like to live with each other of the same race. They feel more comfortable that way. And that's why we're segregated. Or maybe we tell ourselves it's just because of income differences. Uh, on average, African-American incomes are lower than whites. It's not true in every case, but on average, that's true. And so many African-Americans can't afford to move to predominantly white neighborhoods. All of these uh, individual um, bigoted, perhaps, uh, discriminatory uh, actions, uh, self-choice, economic differences, all of these is what's created segregation. And what happened by accident uh, can only unhappen by accident. What happened naturally can only unhappen naturally. We give a name to this rationalization. We say that what we've got is de facto segregation, something that the government did not create. It just sort of developed. Well, as you heard from uh, the introduction, um, I spent a lot of my time writing about education policy, not about housing. I only came to this topic fairly recently, and I want to describe to you how I came to it. Uh, I was uh, the education columnist at the New York Times uh, for uh, several years in the late 1990s and early 2000s, and I spent much of my time denouncing the dominant educational theory of the country at that time that was broadly shared of across the political spectrum. The theory was that there was a, an achievement gap between black and white children. Black children achieved on average at lower levels than white children did. And the reason we had an achievement gap was because teachers had low expectations of black children. They just didn't try very hard. They were lazy. And if only we could force teachers to try harder, the achievement gap would disappear. I thought this was a ludicrous theory. Uh, of course, some teachers are lazy. Uh, some law professors are lazy. Uh, some of you students will go on to careers where you're lazy. But that's not the main reason why we have an achievement gap between black and white children. Uh, the reason we have an achievement gap between black and white children is because so many African-American children come to schools with serious social and economic challenges that impede their ability to learn. Well, nonetheless, we uh, adopted this uh, view as a national policy that lazy teachers uh, were the cause of uh, our differences in, in uh, school outcomes. And we passed a law in 2001 called the No Child Left Behind Law that required uh, students to be tested every year. Uh, the scores 
reported by race. And the idea was that if teachers saw how their black students were achieving at lower levels than white children, uh, they would work harder and the achievement gap would disappear. As I said, I thought this was a ludicrous theory, even though it was enacted into national law. It's more than 20 years on now and the achievement gap is still there. It didn't disappear. Uh, and um, the only thing that that law accomplished really was to give schools an incentive because of all this testing to drop a well-rounded curriculum so that they could uh, focus more time on the test-taking skills. Well, this is what uh, I was thinking about. I, I began to write article after article about what the true causes of the achievement gap were. I remember writing one about the asthma, uh, as you may know, African-American children in urban neighborhoods have asthma at a much higher rate than middle-class children. In some metropolitan areas, it's uh, four times the rate. It's an enormous difference. Uh, African-American children have asthma at such a high rate because they live in more polluted neighborhoods, more trucks driving by their homes, more dilapidated buildings, more vermin in the environment. And if a child has asthma, that child is more likely than a child who doesn't. It's not true in every case, but more likely to be up at night wheezing and then come to school drowsy the next day. And if you have two groups of children who are equal in every respect, identical groups, same racial composition of each group, same uh, social economic background, same family structure, but one group has a slightly higher rate of asthma than the other, that group's gonna have slightly lower achievement simply because it's a drowsier group, all other things being equal. Well, asthma is not a big cause of the achievement gap, but you begin to think of all the other challenges that low-income African-American children have when they come to school asthma. Lead poisoning has a measurable impact on IQ, homelessness, economic insecurity. You begin to get, add all of these up, and there are many others, and you've pretty much explained the achievement gap. You leave le very little explanation left for uh, lazy teachers. Well, I began to realize it's one thing if a child has asthma or lead poisoning or homelessness or economic insecurity, but what happens when you have a school where every child has one or more of these challenges? How can such a school ever be expected to achieve at the same level as a school where children come well-rested, well-nourished from economically secure homes? You can't have that expectation no matter how many laws you enact uh, requiring it. Well, we call schools, we concentrate children in those disadvantages, we call them segregated schools. The schools are more segregated today than they ever have been in the last 50 years in this country, more segregated. And the reason they're more segregated is because the neighborhoods in which they're located are segregated. So as an education policy writer, I suddenly realized that neighborhood segregation was a serious educational problem. In fact, I came to conclude it's the biggest educational problem this country faces. Well, this is what I was thinking about. And then in 2007, I read a Supreme Court decision that uh, many of you, I'm sure, are law students are familiar with. It was a decision in which the Supreme Court evaluated uh, programs of two school districts, Louisville, Kentucky, and Seattle, Washington. Both of them had uh, very, very trivial uh, school desegregation plans that gave parents the choice of which school in the district uh, their child would attend, but if the choice was going to exacerbate segregation, that choice wouldn't be honored in favor of the choice of a child who wouldn't do so. So if you had an all white, for example, all white or mostly white school, there was one place left in that school, but the black and the white uh, parent applied for that last place for their child, the black child uh, would give, be given some preference, help to desegregate the school. As I said, this was a trivial program. There aren't uh, many cases where you have to choose between a black and a white applicant for a limited number of spaces. Uh, but the Supreme Court denounced it, said you couldn't do such a thing. It was a violation of the Constitution to do such a thing. The uh, controlling opinion was written by uh, Chief Justice John Roberts. He acknowledged, he said, yes, the schools in Louisville and Seattle are segregated. But he said the reason they're segregated is because the neighborhoods in which they're located are segregated. And it was a wise observation on the Chief Justice's part. That is why they're segregated. And then he went on to explain in this opinion that the neighborhoods uh, of Louisville and Seattle are segregated uh, because of private bigotry or actions of private businesses or people wanting to live with each other of the same race or economic differences. And 
He said, we have segregation that wasn't created by government. Government is prohibited from doing something to fix it. And of course, he called this de facto segregation and uh, canceled the, um, or forced the two school districts to cancel their program. Well, I read this decision in 2007. I remembered reading about something else that happened in Louisville, Kentucky, one of these two school districts some years before. In Louisville, there was a white homeowner in a single family home in an all white suburb uh, of Louisville called Shively. That white homeowner had an African-American friend living in the center city of Louisville. Uh, that African-American friend was a decorated Navy veteran, had a wife and a child, uh, wanted to move to a single family home, but no realtor would sell him one. So the white homeowner in this suburb of Shively bought a second home in this suburb and um, uh, resold it to his African-American friend. And when the African-American family moved in, an angry white mob surrounded the home, protected by the police. They threw rocks through the windows. The police made no effort to stop this. They dynamited and firebombed the home. The police made no effort to stop that. But when this riot was all over, the state of Kentucky arrested, tried, convicted, and jailed with a 15-year jail sentence. The white homeowner for sedition for having sold a home in a white neighborhood to a black family. And I said to myself, this doesn't sound to me much like de facto segregation. The police, the courts, the entire judicial system, um, these are agents of state government. This was a blatant 14th Amendment violation that's never been remedied. And then I began to look into it further. And I found that I'm not exaggerating here. There were hundreds and hundreds of cases of police protected, sometimes police organized and led mob violence to drive African-Americans out of homes that they had legitimately rented or purchased in white neighborhoods. Every one of these was a constitutional violation, a 14th Amendment violation. Not a single one has ever been remedied. It's something that we as American citizens have an obligation to remedy, this blatant civil rights violation. And then uh, that provoked me to look into it further. And I found it wasn't just state-sponsored violence that has created the segregation that we know today, but rather um, there were many, many federal, state, and local policies, all racially explicit, designed to ensure that African-Americans and whites could not live near one another in any metropolitan area of the country. Uh, let me uh, uh, spend a few minutes uh, before we go to question period to, to describe uh, some of the more powerful, maybe one or two policies that the federal government followed uh, to ensure that we be an apartheid society. Uh, perhaps the most powerful is a program of the Federal Housing Administration and Veterans Administrations in the immediate post-World War II period that was designed to move the entire white working class population out of single family homes, uh, uh, I'm sorry, out of urban neighborhoods into single family homes in all white suburbs like that one of Shively I described before. At the time, uh, we were uh, not a uh, suburban uh, country. Uh, both whites and blacks, working class and middle class families were all living in, in urban areas, white and black families together. We were a manufacturing economy. The factories had to be located near deep water ports and railroad terminals to get their parts and ship their final products. Uh, there were no interstate highways at the time. Uh, that's where factories were located and workers, both in the factories and from the banks and other industries that surfaced those factories had to live um, close to those, those centers of production. Uh, many of them didn't have automobiles. They could maybe take short streetcar rides to work, but we had both black and white families living in urban areas, in many cases in integrated neighborhoods. I'm not suggesting every other house was a different race, but in broadly integrated neighborhoods. We'd be stunned if we were somehow transported back to the early and mid 20th century to see the extent of racial integration that existed then that's unknown today. Well, the federal government decided it was going to move the entire white working class population out of those urban areas into single family homes in all white suburbs and prohibit African-Americans from doing it. 
Uh, perhaps the most famous of these uh, suburbs that the Federal Housing Administration developed, although it did so in every metropolitan area of this country, is uh, in New York, uh, Levittown, east of New York City. Uh, you may be familiar with it. 17,000 homes in Levittown, 17,000 homes in one place. The builder, William Levitt, uh, could, couldn't assemble the capital to buy the land and build 17,000 homes. Uh, nobody would lend it to him. The banks thought this was a crazy idea. Who's going to live in the suburb? Uh, nobody's going to live out there. The only way that Levitt could uh, get the financing to uh, develop this uh, community was by going to the Federal Housing Administration and Veterans Administrations, submitting his plans for the development, the architectural design of the homes, the construction materials he's going to use, the layout of the streets, every detail, and an FHA and VA required commitment that he never sell a home to an African-American. Required commitment. The FHA and VA even required Levitt to place a clause in the deed of every home prohibiting resale to African-Americans or rental to African-Americans. And this was done uh, in suburbs all across the country. We created a white noose around every metropolitan area in the uh, mid 20th century. Um, is this private discrimination or public discrimination? Well, Levitt was a bigot. If it weren't for the FHA and VA, if he could have gotten loans from the banks, he still would have refused to sell to African-Americans. He didn't uh, need the federal government to tell him that. But if as a condition of getting uh, federal bank guarantees, the Federal Housing Administration and Veterans Administration had followed their constitutional responsibilities, they would have told Levitt that will guarantee your bank loans only if you sell homes on a non-discriminatory basis. So his private bigotry was irrelevant. Uh, the only way he could build this development was by a federal requirement that um, he, he do it on a segregated basis and prohibit African-Americans from moving in. Well, the white families who, who bought those homes had no uh, anticipation when they did so. These were working class families, returning war veterans. They had jobs in the post-war boom, had no anticipation that they were going to get rich by owning homes in these places. The homes at the time, these were modest homes, two bedroom, one bath homes, in suburbs all across this country. Uh, homes were um, inexpensive. They cost about eight, $9,000 a piece at that time. The, um, uh, uh, today, those homes in Levittown or in any other suburb like that in the country no longer sell for $100,000. They sell for $200,000, $400,000, so sometimes a million dollars or more in some parts of the country, these $100,000 homes. The white families who bought those homes, uh, returning war veterans, jobs in the post-war economy, manufacturing jobs perhaps, um, uh, gained wealth from the appreciation and the value of their homes. Uh, they used that wealth uh, to send their children to college. They used it to take care of perhaps uh, medical emergencies or temporary unemployment. They used it to subsidize their retirements and they use it to bequeath wealth to their children and grandchildren, who then had down payments for their own homes. African-Americans were prohibited, prohibited by explicit federal policy from participating in this wealth generating program. The result is that today, African-American incomes on average are about 60% of white incomes. There's a disparity there. I don't have to talk about, don't have time to talk about how that developed, but African-American incomes average about 60% of whites. You would think that if African-American incomes averaged about 60% of whites, African-American wealth would also be about 60% of white wealth. But that enormous disparity between a 60% income ratio and a 5% wealth ratio is entirely attributable to unconstitutional federal housing policy. It was practiced in the mid 20th century. It's never been remedied that every one of us has an obligation to remedy. That wealth gap <clears throat> is responsible for almost all of the social inequality between the races that we have today. Uh, I described before how the achievement gap uh, is the result of African-Americans being locked into neighborhoods from which they can't afford to leave because they don't have wealth for down payments uh, for homes in higher opportunity neighborhoods. 
it's responsible for, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> I'm sorry. It's responsible for health disparities between African-Americans and whites. African-Americans have shorter life expectancies, greater rates of cardiovascular disease uh, from living in um, more polluted, more dangerous neighborhoods, less access to grocery stores, selling fresh food, for example. <clears throat> it's responsible for the mass incarceration of African-American young men. I'm not suggesting that <clears throat> no police officer would ever abuse a young man if it weren't for uh, racial segregation created by this wealth gap. <clears throat> But it's much more intense as a result when you concentrate the most disadvantaged young men in single neighborhoods without access to good jobs, without having had access to schools that aren't overwhelmed by the social and economic problems of the students. When you concentrate young men in neighborhoods like that, it's inevitable <clears throat> that the uh, uh, police are going to engage in confrontations, in, co uh, in confrontations with them. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, you should, um, thank you. Uh, it's inevitable that the police are going to engage in confrontations with them. And um, it's also responsible for something else that's very, very frightening and dangerous. And that's uh, the enormous political polarization that exists in this country today. That's probably greater than any time uh, since the 1850s prior to the Civil War. Uh, it doesn't, it's not entirely racial but it largely tracks racial lines, as, as we all know. How can we ever expect uh, to develop the common national identity that we need to preserve this democracy if so many African-Americans and whites live so far from each other that they have no ability to understand each other, no ability to empathize with each other or to comprehend each other's life experiences? That's an ongoing consequence of the unconstitutional policy that the federal government followed in the uh, mid 20th century in its financing of the suburbanization of this country on a racially exclusive basis. <clears throat> uh, let me talk about one other policy that the federal government followed that was also powerful in creating segregation, public housing. Something I think that we all misunderstand, uh, at least I did before I began this research. We think of public housing as a place where poor people live, lots of, um, uh, low-income um, uh, mothers with uh, children, uh, single mothers, uh, lots of those young men I described a minute ago who are uh, living in um, concentrated uh, areas of disadvantage. Um, that's not how public housing began in this country. Uh, poor people were not permitted into public housing when uh, the um, public housing programs were first begun during the New Deal in the Depression in the Roosevelt administration. Public housing at that time was for those working class, middle class families uh, who um, had no housing because very little housing was being constructed during the depression. We had a housing shortage and the New Deal built the first civilian public housing in this country in cities all over the country and everywhere it built it, it segregated it frequently, frequently creating segregation where it hadn't previously existed. I mentioned before we had a much more uh, uh, non-segregated neighborhoods then than we have now. <clears throat> uh, the great African-American poet, novelist, playwright, Langston Hughes, uh, wrote in his autobiography that he grew up in an integrated downtown Cleveland neighborhood. We don't think of downtown Cleveland that way today. Uh, he said his best friend in high school was Polish. He said he dated a Jewish girl in high school. This was an integrated high school in Cleveland, um, uh, in an integrated neighborhood. The Public Works Administration, the first New Deal agency, went into that neighborhood of Cleveland, demolished some housing, and built two separate projects, public housing projects, one for middle-class, working-class whites, one for middle-class, working-class African-Americans, creating segregation where it hadn't previously existed. And with other projects built elsewhere in Cleveland, reinforced that pattern. And this was done all over the country. Uh, in, in my book, The Color of Law, I like uh, where I can to focus on smug, self-satisfied places. They think they're better than everybody else. Uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts is one of them. You've probably heard of it. Uh, the area between Harvard and MIT, the Central Square neighborhood, was a fully integrated neighborhood in the 1930s, about half white and half black. The federal government built two separate projects in that neighborhood, one for blacks, one for whites, 
creating segregation where it hadn't previously existed. During World War II, hundreds of thousands of workers, black and white, uh, flocked to centers of war protection to take jobs in war industries that hadn't existed prior to the war. They overwhelmed the um, places that they had come to work in. There was no housing for them there. If the government wanted the planes and the ships and the uh, tanks, the, the jeeps to be produced, it had to create housing for workers in these uh, centers of war production. And it did. Everywhere it did it, it built the housing for war workers on a segregated basis. These were workers working in the same war plants, but built housing for workers on a segregated basis, uh, frequently creating segregation where it hadn't previously existed. The West Coast is a good example of this because there were very few African-Americans living on the West Coast prior to World War II. Well, there were a few. Some had come during the Gold War rush a uh, uh, hundred years before, but uh, mostly there were very few African-Americans living on the West Coast. Uh, they came to take jobs in, during World War II in the war industries. And the government housing created segregation in places where it hadn't previously existed because there were too few African-Americans to segregate. Uh, in San Francisco, the federal government built uh, five projects, four for whites only and one for African-Americans and placed it uh, in a location that became the African-American neighborhood of San Francisco, the segregated neighborhood of San Francisco. Across the Bay, another one of those smug places, Berkeley, California, <clears throat> was the site of housing for shipyard workers, building ships in the giant Richmond shipyards. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, in Berkeley and a, a neighboring uh, town, uh, coincidentally called Albany, California, uh, the federal government built um, war housing projects for the white workers uh, along the residential areas of uh, Berkeley and Albany, and for the black workers along the railroad tracks and the industrial area. <clears throat> Again, creating segregation where it hadn't previously existed. Uh, well, these are just a few of the many policies that federal, state, and local governments uh, followed uh, in order to create the segregation that we know today. Uh, the notion of de facto segregation is other nonsense. There's no basis in reality to it whatsoever. As I said before, of course, there was private bigotry involved, but had not the government structured the choices of private individuals to um, uh, act on a segregated basis, we wouldn't have the segregation that we know today. We would be a very, very different uh, society. The policies to redress segregation are well known. There's no mystery about them. Um, policy writers, uh, housing experts, uh, journalists like me, we all write about policy ideas all the time. What's missing is not policy ideas. What's missing is a new civil rights movement, like the one we had in the 19. 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, that's going to engage in massive organizing to make it um, impossible for the country to continue living in the apartheid the condition that we now do. Uh, I can give you a few examples of the kinds of policies that are necessary, but as I say, there's no political support for them today. Uh, without a new political movement that's going to create that support, they can't happen. I mentioned those suburbs like Levittown or, or like any others across the country, uh, homes that uh, were affordable to African-Americans when they were built, but are now unaffordable to them. <clears throat> the federal government as a narrowly targeted remedy, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry, <clears throat> as a narrowly targeted remedy, <clears throat> to a uh, specific constitutional violation, the federal government should be buying up homes at market rates as they come for sale in these communities and reselling them at deeply discounted rates to African-Americans to make them affordable to them. That, as I said, uh, you're all law students, that would be a narrowly targeted remedy for a very specific constitutional violation. We don't do it not because we don't know that it's the right thing to do. <clears throat> we don't do it uh, because there's no political will to do it. Uh, at the low end of the income scale, we have many other policies that uh, reinforce segregation today, uh, not uh, explicitly as it was done uh, prior to 1968, but just as powerfully. The biggest uh, uh, program we have for lower income families, uh, 
rentals is the low income housing tax credit. It's a federal tax credit distributed to states that in turn distribute them to um, housing developers to build uh, low income housing units. It reinforces segregation because those units are disproportionately placed in existing low income segregated neighborhoods. Uh, uh, white communities, white suburban communities, higher opportunity communities typically have zoning rules that prohibit the construction of multifamily units, keeping those uh, units out. Uh, those you know, zoning, you, zoning rules, in my judgment, are unconstitutional because they perpetuate an unconstitutionally created uh, segregation. Uh, developers would rather place those units in low-income segregated neighborhoods because the land is cheaper there. They don't have to explain in hundreds of community meetings why they're bringing black and brown children into your neighborhood. Uh, it's easy to rent an apartment in a low-income housing tax credit unit if it's in a segregated neighborhood because eligible people will walk by and see the for rent sign. Uh, all of these uh, policies are uh, reinforced by state rules uh, for where low-income housing projects should be built. That would be an easy program to reform. We could give a priority to developers who are willing to place uh, low-income housing tax credit units in higher opportunity neighborhoods. Again, we don't do it not because we don't know what to do. We don't do it because um, there's no political will. The same thing is true of the Section 8 voucher program. It also reinforces segregation today. You're probably familiar with the Section 8 voucher program. It's a subsidy to tenants themselves, not to the developers, but to tenants that supplements their income so they can afford to uh, rent apartments. Uh, it reinforces segregation because the overwhelming number of Section 8 vouchers are usable only in low-income segregated neighborhoods. The voucher, for example, is calculated uh, on the basis of what it costs to rent an apartment at the median rent for a large metropolitan area. Well, you don't have to be an arithmetic genius to realize that the median rent in a metropolitan area is gonna be too low to rent in higher opportunity neighborhoods. It's actually gonna be too high to rent in low-income segregated neighborhoods and landlords in those neighborhoods <clears throat> can exploit the program by charging more than the market would otherwise uh, require. That program would be, could be easily reformed. There are a few jurisdictions that have voluntarily uh, changed the way in which they calculate their vouchers so that they're worth more in higher opportunity neighborhoods and worth less in uh, segregated neighborhoods, low-income segregated neighborhoods. Um, we don't do that not because we don't know that we should do it. We don't do it because there's no political will. Well, as I said, uh, these policies are well known. Without a new civil rights movement, um, they won't come to be. Uh, I am working with a group of um, national civil rights leaders to create something that uh, they call uh, the redress movement, putting organizers and communities around the country to create help and support local civil rights activists in creating the momentum to demand these policies. I hope that uh, someday uh, you all have an opportunity to participate in that uh, movement. With that, I think I've used up my time. I wanna thank you for your attention and I'd be glad to take questions in the time that's remaining. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Rothstein, that was fantastic. Uh, so the, the first question I have here, which comes from a member of the audience and actually kind of ties into what you were briefly touching on a minute ago there is, what are the potential solutions that could be enacted to reverse segregation at the local level or is it just a state and federal effort uh, to remedy uh, the situation? Uh, as you say, I did answer that. I'll, I'll, I'll repeat some of it and add some more to it. Ab abolition of zoning rules, for example, is um, that uh, what we call exclusionary zoning <clears throat> is uh, one local program uh, that can be done. In most states, I, I really am not familiar with all um, 50 and I'm not that familiar with New York. I don't know if uh, New York preempts the, the ability of local jurisdictions to modify their zoning rules, but in most states, it's something within the power of local jurisdictions to do. And um, that's one thing. Uh, something that's related, but it's uh, what I just referred to is called exclusionary zoning. Um, a related program is inclusionary zoning 
which requires uh, that developers of um, larger developments, not that large, uh, you know, 10, 25 units, either homes or apartments in any community. And this is a community level policy that can be enacted in any community requires that developers um, set aside a share of units. Usually it's around 15% of the units in this development or homes in the development uh, to be affordable for moderate and lower income families who are likely to be disproportionately uh, African-American or increasingly Hispanic. Um, <clears throat> there are many policies we can enact that would um, improve the resources in existing low-income segregated neighborhoods. Those are just as important as the mobility programs I've been referring to that um, uh, permit uh, African-Americans to move into communities from which they've been previously excluded. Uh, one of them is rent control. Uh, you're familiar with that in New York. It has the most uh, aggressive rent control program in the country, but still not enough to prevent the displacement of African-Americans from gentrifying neighborhoods. Um, limits on condominium conversions would be another. Uh, inclusionary zoning in um, lower income neighborhoods as well that are, that are in the process of gentrifying would be another. Freezes on property taxes for existing homeowners is another. Many African-Americans lose their homes that they own frequently outright, not with a mortgage. Uh, they lose their homes because as their neighborhoods appreciate in value, they can no longer afford to pay their property taxes. And so they are forced either to sell their homes or they lose them in foreclosures. Uh, we should freeze property taxes for existing homeowners. Uh, you know, California did that uh, I don't know, almost 40 years ago now, and it was a disaster. It, it, destroyed the budgets of schools and fire departments and libraries that depend on property taxes, but that's not a necessary consequence of a freeze on property taxes. A community can freeze its property taxes uh, on existing homeowners and recoup the lost property taxes at point of sale. So if you've got a, a low or moderate income neighborhood, you've got, uh, for example, an African-American family, but it wouldn't just be African-Americans, bought a home uh, some years ago for $50,000 and uh, didn't have to pay property taxes on anything higher than $50,000 of 100% of, of assessed value, and then sells its home today for $300,000. Uh, it then re returns the lost property taxes to the public treasury. And instead of making a, a $250,000 capital gain, it only makes a $200,000 capital gain. That would be a, the kind of policy uh, that we should enact. You know, I, I think I, I may have mentioned I'm writing a new book uh, uh, on what we can do about um, what local activists can do in their local communities to redress racial segregation. It will include uh, some of the policies that I've described just now and, and many, many others. That's great. Uh, so that I'll shift gears briefly to a question from the audience. And uh, like we put in the chat, if anyone has a question, uh, either in the audience or, or virtually, uh, please feel free to share it. Uh, so the first question is from Ruchi. Um, what did you learn about the differences in social services slash social infrastructure, especially as it relates to community building, uh, such as libraries, public transport, uh, and safe environments where people can gather? Well, uh, African-American neighborhoods typically are of lower incomes are less poorly resourced in every way than middle-class neighborhoods, uh, especially in states like yours in the Northeast that depend for things uh, like libraries and, and uh, fire departments on local property taxes, suffer uh, if they uh, have a lower income population where property values are lower. Uh, you're, you're familiar with that, uh, I'm sure, uh, even more than, uh, than I do. Um, the uh, health facilities, healthcare facilities are less adequate in uh, uh, low-income neighborhoods. People are more dependent on emergency departments, uh, less, the, less uh, access to primary care physicians. We have a big shortage of primary care physicians in uh, low-income segregated neighborhoods. This is another uh, resource deprivation. I'm sure you're all aware of the fact that um, 
even the private sector. Uh, grocery stores selling fresh and healthy food are uh, much more absent in low-income segregated neighborhoods than in white middle-class uh, neighborhoods. So with uh, lower average incomes, as well as the lack of political power on the part of residents in low-income segregated neighborhoods, the resources across a wide spectrum of uh, uh, policy areas are less adequate. <clears throat> Okay, great. Uh, the next question comes from uh, Serena White Lake, uh, who is a professor at the law school. Uh, she asked, the color of law documents how banks consistently refuse to give mortgages to African Americans, even to those who were credit worthy, because the FHA would not guarantee mortgages for African Americans. So she asked, were the banks just passing the buck, or couldn't banks have given credit worthy, financially stable African Americans mortgages, even without the FHA guarantees? Well, of course they could have, um, but as uh, you probably know, uh, FHA guarantees require uh, mortgages with FHA and, and VA guarantees require much, much lower down payments uh, than uh, conventional mortgages. Uh, that's, the, that's why people are willing to pay or have to pay the premium, uh, the insurance premium that's part of an FHA mortgage, which raises their monthly costs but requires a much lower down payment. So yes, banks could have done that if they wanted to, uh, but um, uh, I described earlier how uh, little wealth compared to white families uh, African-Americans have. And so they're much more dependent on lower down payment programs than whites are. Uh, the next question is, what are some of the ways that we can incentivize city planners and developers to design city plans that promote economic development, uh, such as commercialism, uh, without perpetuating gentrification and displacement of marginalized communities? Well, I'm, I, uh, you can accuse me of being a broken record if you wish, but um, without a political movement, uh, there are no incentives you can impose. We know what the policies are to prevent the uh, displacement from gentrification. I mentioned them a few minutes ago. Rent control, limits on condominium conversions, uh, inclusionary zoning policies, uh, freezes on property taxes. We, the, the reason we don't do those things uh, to the extent necessary to prevent displacement is not because we don't know what to do. And it's not because planners don't know what to do. The reason we don't do them is there's no political support for them. And that's why a, a new activist movement like the one we had in the 1960s. I'm not suggesting that the tactics or strategies it would use would be um, identical, but we need a new activist movement that's going to create a different political environment to implement the policies that we well know are needed. Let me mention one other, and this is something I, I don't know if uh, Albany uh, uh, has or other cities in New York have, but land trusts. Uh, there are uh, cities in particular are in control of a lot of unused land. They should be donated to land trusts and uh, affordable housing, both single family homes and uh, apartments uh, should be built on that donated land by uh, nonprofit land trusts, which exist in many, many communities uh, across the country. I don't know if they exist in yours. One of the, uh... Audience members just put a chat asking about uh, housing tr uh, the trust model, and you, you mentioned it right after. So I think uh, she read your mind there. Uh, anyway, so the uh, the next question is: uh, prejudice is something very slow to change. Uh, what is your thought on institutional changes? As small as messages uh, we can, as small as messages we receive from our parents or household in promoting empathy and reducing prejudice. Um, let me go back one second to the land trust question. Mm -hmm. um, again, I don't know if you have one there in Albany, but the um, most uh, uh, the initial one, the one that not the initial one, but the one that set the pattern for land trusts across the country is right across the river from you or the lake um, in Burlington, Vermont, uh, that was created um, a few decades ago and has set the pattern for land trusts uh, everywhere. So, OK, your question uh, that I, I um, was about, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, okay. Yes, uh, reducing prejudice. In his oh, right yes. Okay. Yeah. Parents Look, um, there's a, a, a myth, a misunderstanding that um, uh, 
private bigotry creates policies. And uh, that's not how it happens. It happens to some extent, but policies create private bigotry. We know we have experience in one area, the military, the most integrated institution in American society. You bring black and white soldiers together who uh, uh, work uh, in common as peers, develop respect for each other. I'm not suggesting that there are no racial policies in the military, but they're trivial compared to what goes on in American society. Uh, when African-Americans and whites are exposed to each other as peers, prejudices disappear. People come to understand that um, uh, they, uh, there are people just like them. I would like to recommend to you a uh, project uh, in Chicago done by a, a very creative artist and her name is Tanika Johnson, T-O-N-I-K-A Johnson. And if you look her up on the web and look for the, the foldedmapproject.com, one word, she's done a very creative thing. She, uh, Chicago, but you don't need this gimmick that she used uh, because it's now being duplicated elsewhere without the um, gimmick. In Chicago, it's, it's a city that's organized on a grid. So you can fold the map in half uh, along the line in the center of the city that really divides the black and the white sides of the city. And a, uh, for example, a, a black uh, home at 6300 uh, South, make up a, a word, uh, South Ashland Avenue. If, when you fold the map, will sit right up on top of a home um, at 6300 North Ashland, that's a white home. And what she did was she called these people map twins and she invited them to meet each other and invite each other to each other's homes. And uh, yes, uh, somebody has just put a link to um, her overall website and it goes to the, um, uh, uh, the Folder Map Project as well. And all of a sudden, these people who had these terrible stereotypes of each other got to realize that these people were just like them. Although one had higher, more value homes, one had the, uh, that, the white one, uh, had uh, higher paying jobs, but uh, they developed a lot in common and began to help each other uh, across the city. These are people, whites, Chicago is a very segregated city, uh, but not more than many places. Uh, uh, whites who'd never been to the south side of Chicago, uh, they'd been warned never to go there. When the map twins were, were created, they, uh, they began to visit their twins in, on the south side and learned a lot about the community and saw that all of their stereotypes were um, false. So it's, it's certainly the case that, the, that to some extent bigotry creates structures, but structures also create stereotypes. And uh, unless we implement policies to uh, uh, create non-segregated communities, it's very unlikely that we will develop the empathy with each other. Um, uh, that's necessary to um, move forward. Okay, so with five minutes left here, I want to make sure I get to everyone's questions. So I'm going to go to uh, Allie next. And she asks, why do you think so many legislative bodies lack the political will to make changes? Uh, since 2020, there has been a national mass movement for Black lives. Uh, in New York, there was a strong and growing tenant power movement. Uh, why are so many politicians able to get away with making um, with making any significant systematic changes that would create true equity for all? Well, because the, a new civil rights movement hasn't coalesced around these issues with the political strength to make it happen. You know, you talk about 2020. Yes, we had 20 million Americans participate in Black Lives Matter demonstrations. Most of them were white. Most of these participants were white, unheard of in American history. 20 million people, mostly white participating in Black Lives Matter demonstrations. And when the demonstrations were, were over, those white suburbanites went home, put Black Lives Matter signs on their lawns, and that was the end of it. And uh, they weren't organized subsequently to follow through to really do something to make Black Lives Matter. So that's why uh, this redress movement that I mentioned before is going to be, I hope, uh, so important. Uh, uh, those uh, the suburbanites, uh, along with the, the, the tenant groups that you referred to, uh, need to be organized. And uh, when they come together, we can create a powerful political movement. You know, we're having a more accurate and passionate discussion about race in this country today than we ever have had before in American history. Accurate as well as passionate. 
than ever before. We have um, you know, elected white Southern politicians running around the South, removing statues to commemorate the defenders of, of slavery. Uh, what's missing is not understanding. What's missing is organization. And uh, if that organization develops, I'm hopeful, not confident, but I'm hopeful that the political will will develop to implement these policies as well. So when you say organization, do you mean at the, at the grassroots level or are you talking? Yes, I, I mean at the grassroots level and the new book that uh, I'm working on that will be published in a, a year or so, a little bit more, um, will describe uh, what these groups can do right. to uh, organize themselves and to create that, uh, that power. So the, the next question, it was a response to your early que uh, an earlier question about uh, when you were discussing uh, city planning and gentrification, um, uh, the response, um, is there any incentive that we can give to politicians, I think at any level, uh, to have them make change and give them an incentive to um, make positive change? Well, the only incentive the politicians have is the votes of their constituents. I am... Um... I don't know what else I can I can say about that. Yeah, uh, yeah. No, okay. Um, so this is, an, I think, this might be our last question, unless I see any other questions either in the chat or among the audience mm -hmm. here. Uh, but I just want to make um, how do you use your platform to amplify voices of people of color who are directly impacted by the discrimination you write about? I, I don't know. I, I, I wish I could um, find something original to say. The way you amplify voices is with organization, by community organizers, um, you know, by uh, what the great uh, late congressman and uh, civil rights leader of the 1960s, John Lewis, uh, 1960s, John Lewis referred to as making good trouble to uh, amplify those voices. Um, it's, you know, we... Um, you know, I have a friend who is a former uh, director counsel of the uh, NAACP Legal Defense Fund, who once gave a talk who said that the um, Brown versus Board of Education decision had one very negative effect. And uh, he said that was that the most uh, dedicated, creative, passionate, social justice oriented young African Americans decided that the way to make social change was not to become organizers, but to become lawyers. And they have it backwards. Of course we need lawyers, uh, but uh, if the uh, organizers aren't do doing things that the lawyers need to defend, uh, the lawyers are gonna be uh, working for corporations and uh, not engaged in social change. Great, and then in the last minute, here we go, one more question. How much wealth do you estimate was stolen from black families due to redlining? I don't have an estimate. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Hard, hard to uh, add a yeah. number to it. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Rossi. I know I personally enjoyed it. I know everyone else here did as well. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, so at, at this point, we're going to take a 10 minute break before we uh, uh, jump into our panel here. Uh, so we'll return at uh, 1240. And again, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rossi, for your time. Thank you. All right, seems like I'm going to switch this to gallery so we can all in the audience can see everyone. All right, without further ado, we'll get started here. So I'll start by introducing everyone. So our moderator this afternoon is Professor Rosenblum. Jonathan Rosenblum is a visiting professor of law at Albany Law School, teaching sustainability, land use, and racial justice. Jonathan is the Director of Faculty Development and International Programs at Vermont Law School. His scholarship has been published in numerous law reviews and, is he, and he is one of the top 100 scholars ranked on Hein Online. His scholarship has been cited in over 125 federal opinions. Jonathan received his bachelor's in architecture from Rhode Island School of Design, his JD from New York Law School and LLM from Harvard, from Harvard Law School. Sarah Niles is a senior attorney in the Civil Rights Division of Housing and Civil Enforcement Section at the U.S. Department of Justice, where she enforces the Fair Housing Act and Equal Credit Opportunity Act. During her 17 years in the Housing and Civil Enforcement Section, 
Ms. Niles has investigated and resolved numerous fair housing and fair lending matters, including fair lending cases involving discriminatory redlining. Stuart Rossman is a staff attorney at the National Consumer Law Center and has served as director of litigation since 1999. He has been a member of the adjunct faculty at the Northeastern University School of Law, where he teaches courses in civil trial advocacy and was appointed the 2010 Gilbelber Distinguished Lecturer on Public Interest Law. He graduated summa cum laude from the University of Michigan and cum laude from Harvard Law School. Ladale Winling, Winling is an associate professor of history at Virginia Tech. He is a co-creator of the project Mapping Inequality, Redlining in New Deal America, which excavates the archives of the Homeowners Loan Corporation to illustrate the rise of redlining. Matthew Lasner is an associate professor of urban studies and planning at Hunter College CUNY, where he teaches courses on US and global urbanism, housing and the built environment. He has published widely on the culture, politics and design of 20th century US housing. He earned his PhD in architecture and planning at Harvard and a master's degree in planning at the London School of Economics. Charnel Hicks has 30 years of experience in comprehensive and reasonable planning, economic development and public outreach. She has management consulting experience in business organizational development and frequently shares her professional knowledge on expert conference panels. Most recently, she gave a keynote address to the City Planning and Urban Design Conference in 2016 in Istanbul, Turkey. In 2016, Char Charnel was recognized as one of the Philadelphia minority business leaders by the, by the Philadelphia Business Journal. And before I, so that's the uh, panel today. Before I pass it off to Professor Rosenblum, uh, we'll do the same uh, system with the questions as we did before. Uh, audience members, if you have a question, uh, write it down on the index cards here. And then any guests over Zoom, uh, just comment in the Q&A chat and we'll get through it uh, towards the end of the panel discussion. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining us and uh, I'll pass it off to Professor Rosenblum, thank you. Thank you, Connor, and thank you, Connor and Kristen. It has uh, really been a fabulous presentation so far today and it's wonderful to see the panelists, very much looking forward to the rest of the afternoon. So let's dive right in. Uh, Charnel, why don't we start it off with you. Uh, Richard Rothstein in his discussion earlier today mentioned several times the importance of a new political movement. If there was one thing local governments across the country should do tomorrow uh, to address equity and inclusion and land use and housing, what do you think it should be? Do you agree with him or in the context of land use housing, what are the biggest hurdles today? Yeah, so I do agree in, in some respects, um, but uh, local governments are not in the business of um, of generating grassroots political movements, right? So I think there's a, a non sequitur there. It's, it's not a point of disagreement. It's just a point of the roles that each of us have to play. And so for each of us, the role that, um, that we could play, the, the role that the students could play is by getting involved and organizing politically and influencing local government. So, um, Many local governments have policies in place for um, equity and inclusion um, to combat the historic racism, um, but there needs to be more engagement uh, on the local level. Uh, local governments need to encourage um, engagement on the parts of their constituents to hold them accountable for following through on the policies that they already have in place and to for developing new policies. So I would say um, engagement is one. And then the other one is just having um, racial and other diversity in, um, in the ranks of practitioners, lawyers, and others, so that um, there are just more people with more diverse backgrounds working on doing this work. Um, I think that when the work is done by folks from you know, folks from black and brown communities, from lower income um, communities, uh, urban, rural, whatever, the outcomes are more equitable. Thanks, Chanel. And, and so again, for the audience, you know, please make sure to add any comments into the Q&A and we can field them as they come in or uh, wait for the appropriate moment. 
The other thing that, that we're looking to do is uh, have a discourse. So I'll turn it over to, to the folks on the panel. Liddell, you want to um, follow up on anything that Sharnel mentioned? Well, you know, this notion that there needs to be a new political movement, and Rothstein probably thinks most um, highly or finds it most effective to, to draw on the kind of memory of like the mid-century civil rights movement. And um, I think that's that's not the only model. There are, in fact, like political activists and political coalitions working on this now. And um, like there's there's equity and housing advocates um, as well as like anti-poverty advocates and right like the NAACP's Legal Defense Fund like still exists and battles this now. And so in some ways, like the, the kind of mobilization that, you know, is necessary for developing and changing and um, reforming, remediating public policy, you know, simply needs to um, kind of develop um, like connections in coalition, right? The environmental justice movement, people like um, Charles Lee and Robert Bullard used to say that um, essentially like, the real challenge was getting civil rights activists to talk to like environmental advocates, right? To see that there was like a potential overlap between these two movements in the 1980s and 1990s. And that was right, kind of like political mobilization. And so, you know, um, I, I would say like we should all think of ourselves as like private citizens who can right kind of change our local communities are involved in um, professional societies professional organizations that like develop and change like best practices and professional standards right when we think about like repealing um zoning or reforming single family zoning uh, um ordinances right there's a whole host of like best practices that were created by people and that can be reformed and changed within like professional societies or in kind of like local local zoning boards and you know like the um, example of um, Hennepin County Minnesota right where they've kind of re repealed single family um, residential zoning as a result of understanding the kind of um, legacies of racial segregation as well as the inherently exclusionary nature of land use zoning and single family zoning like came about as a wide uh, 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 as a result of kind of a, a, a wide set of actions to to mobilize inform the public and um to like find policies that can be managed at the kind of local and regional level Thanks, Dale. Yeah, I think that's really important. This, you know, uh, Richard Rothstein brought that up too. This idea that it goes beyond housing, especially with something like zoning, where we can start looking at environmental justice, food, air pollution, um, health, pedestrian mobility, and other things. Uh, yeah, Matt, what, what are you what are you thinking? Well, I was <laughs> thinking about um, uh, Charnel's answer and then and Liddell's answer. I was thinking about how, you know, it, and Rothstein kind of glossed this over. I mean. Uh, fair housing was central to the mid-century civil rights movement. I mean, we can go back to the late 1930s um, and see NAACP and others involved in uh, on the front lines of demanding fair access to housing. And I think, you know, some of the limitations of that movement it speak to some of the problems that we're still facing today and that also speak to, I think, some of the limits of, of Rothstein's view which is, you know, housing is not like the army or like schools or public accommodations. There's it, it, it and I and I sort of fundamentally disagree with the point that the law creates prejudice in housing. You know, housing is such a complex and dynamic. You know, it's like an octopus with all these tentacles, and segregation is so deeply embedded um, in American culture, and it manifests in so many different ways. Um, in housing. So when I think about kind of, you know, certainly we need to have uh, national support and, and national voices, but 
uh, you know, so much, so much of where the rubber meets the road in terms of segregation in housing is happening, you know, in the professions, right? It's happening in banking, in appraisal, um, in lending, in real estate sales. Uh, and then there's so many other ways, too. I mean, uh, uh, it happens in architecture. It happens in screening processes and co-ops and condos. It happens in, you know, CC&Rs, uh, conditions, uh, covenants and restrictions and deeds, which is a practice that dates back to the 1890s. Uh, there are just uh, so many complicated mechanisms. When I think about what we need to do immediately, I think about uh, dramatically expanding support for affirmatively furthering fair housing um, at HUD. I think about all the different kind of uh, 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 exposés uh, in terms of steering, in terms of appraisal, in terms of you know generating. Um, you know, it needs to happen at a lot of levels in a lot of places. Uh, sort of simultaneously in order to, to tame this uh, persistent, pernicious beast. There's a lot in there, Matt. Thank you. First, I have to give a shout out to my property law students on Matthew's comments. Notice discussion about covenants that we discussed, but also when you were talking about uh, state action, just today we happened to discuss the Midkiff case, which you can, there's a lot to say about Midkiff and the reallocation of property rights in Hawaii and whether or not that was successful, but it was really relevant to, to what you're talking about. It also provides a, a sort of a nice segue to, to something that I wanted to ask you, Sarah and Stuart, and that's, a, and maybe we'll start with you, Sarah, and, and it's kind of a two-part question, but, you know, on this, this, on the federal level, how do you determine which cases are appropriate for federal enforcement, and, and what types of evidence does the Department of Justice use to support these claims? Sure. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, so we get our cases, our redlining cases, either from referrals from the bank regulatory agencies, the Federal Reserve Bank, the FDIC, the OCC, the CFPB, or uh, we generate them in-house. And the way that we decide which cases to look at in-house um, is that we do an annual survey of HMDA data. Um, that is publicly available data that uh, gives information about the race of borrowers in, in various jurisdictions. And so we'll look at that data and decide and, and compare different lenders and how they are lending in majority Black and Hispanic census tracts um, in various metropolitan areas. Um, and what we, what we try to do is we pick off the outliers, which lenders are really lending less than their peers, other banks of similar lending volume um, in those affected tracks. And then we'll look at those banks more closely to see, well, why is that? What's going on here? Where are their branches located? Where are they doing their marketing and outreach? Uh, where are they, are they assigning loan officers to these affected tracks um, if they don't have branches in those tracks? And are they training and incentivizing those loan officers to service these affected tracks? Um, there's other types of evidence that we look at, but we kind of we another another thing is that the the banks themselves are also monitoring their performance. They are supposed to have compliance departments that are looking at where they're lending and how they're doing, and so if they are not lending proportionately in uh, these affected tracks, then they should be doing something about that. Um, so that's that's another piece of evidence that we look at. And we kind of put this all together and decide, is there evidence that this lender is avoiding doing business in the affected tracks? And if so, that would be a type of case that we would bring. Thanks, Sarah. I know, uh, Stuart, you want to weigh in on this one, right? So, uh... Uh, I have, uh, first of all, I just want to say uh, just one response to uh, uh, Mr. Rothstein on something he said towards the end, since we are talking mostly to law school students, that you talked about that uh, we need more activists and fewer lawyers. I think we need more activist lawyers is what we need. And there's plenty of a role for, for lawyers to take the lead uh, in terms of dealing with uh, social injustice uh, and discrimination going forward. So um, uh, Sarah and I talked beforehand. I, I came from a background of being the Massachusetts Attorney General's office. Um, and I miss the resources that Sarah has available to her in order to be able to investigate cases uh, in advance. Uh, I am left solely to look at the public record. 
uh, Sarah can do some investigation demands and get access to all sorts of information as a government body uh, that a private enforcement uh, group does not have. But I think that we play a very important role uh, in two significant ways. Um, there are um, cases that simply are, are too small for Sarah and her, her division to be able to, uh, to take on. Uh, there are cases that, uh, you know, they, they will certainly, as she said, look for the outliers, but there are other cases uh, that, that certainly merit attention that we can get uh, involved in uh, as well. And I think those are, are, are very important cases. Um, but I think that the other thing that, that we do uh, as well is that there's a phenomenon that really began uh, in the late 1990s. And uh, I don't mean to create a misnomer on today's session, but uh, we see as much of a problem with what we refer to as reverse redlining uh, as we do with, with redlining. Uh, as access to credit uh, has become much more difficult. And I think that uh, you know, access to credit is you know, a civil right in and of itself. Uh, in modern society, uh, having equal access to credit is almost a necessity. Um, and it's not only in the housing area, it's also in cars, student loans, uh, credit cards, the, the whole raft of, of credit services uh, that help to, to maintain the segregated society that, uh, that we have. We can go after those cases um, uh, as well. And so I think that that is a, an area where as private enforcement, uh, we can work around the, the margins, but particularly in the, in the reverse red line area where rather than having someone being denied access uh, to credit, rather people who do not normally have access to prime credit are the targets of subprime lenders and predatory lenders to direct what are bad credit, uh, credit products or discriminatory credit products into neighborhoods that, that purportedly have no other alternative uh, available to them. And so uh, we are very fortunate that the two statutes that we're talking about today, the Fair Housing Act and the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, uh, both have been held consistently uh, to provide that you can not only uh, bring cases for redlining, but for reverse redlining cases, um, and that you can bring cases not only for intentional discrimination, which is really more of a, a, a redlining uh, situation, um, and far more looking at disparate impact cases, which is a whole different type of discrimination case that can be brought under the ECOA of the Fair Housing Act, uh, where various organizations have maintained policies, uh, which although neutral on their face, result in a disparate impact on a protected category uh, under the respective statutes. Uh, meaning that the, the purportedly neutral policy results in the fact that, that uh, whether it be uh, people of color, communities of color, but also uh, age groups, sexual uh, orientation and, and sex across the board, that those policies have a disparate impact and result in them uh, paying for credit far more than they should under normal circumstances. Uh, so we have the advantage of being able to do, to do that. Um, I don't want to monopolize the time, but there are also things I am somewhat jealous sometimes with, with Sarah, that she has certain uh, powers that I used to have when I was in government that I don't have as a uh, private attorney. Um, I have to deal with different pleading standards uh, after the uh, Iqbal case. Um, I have to deal with standing issues that the government doesn't have to deal with after the Ramirez case that came down uh, earlier uh, last year, proving that I have standing. Uh, perhaps for the uh, most important for uh, the purposes of this uh, discussion of private enforcement, uh, the standards for class certification are much more difficult, even if there's no arbitration clause that has a class action ban, which is far less frequent in the housing area because Fannie and Freddie prohibit arbitration clauses in, uh, uh, in mortgages that they resell on the secondary market. So as a result, they're far less uh, frequent in those circumstances. Uh, but uh, getting class certification is very, very difficult. And uh, the last element that I have to deal with is that when we have private enforcement under the FHA in particular, but also I would suspect under the ECOA, uh, that the standard for showing causation and, uh, and the relationship between the policies that we believe that are leading to the discrimination um, and the actual disparate numbers has to be robust. And that's very difficult to prove given the kinds of statistical information that I ordinarily have available to me, certainly before I file suit, but even then when I go through discovery afterwards. Uh, thanks, Stuart. Because we are in a law school setting, can you uh, do us a favor here, Stuart? Can you, first of all, define the difference between redlining and reverse redlining for everyone, just to make sure we're all on the same page? But then also, uh, Stuart, and, and feel free to, to weigh in on this, Sarah, as well. If you could just talk very succinctly, just so everyone knows, what are we talking about when you say 
intentional discrimination suits versus disparate impact suits. What's the difference there? Particularly, um, tell us the difference between the burden of proof as well. Well, I, I'll start off by just discussing the difference between redlining and reverse redlining, and then I'll let Sarah take the, the first lead in terms of talking about the differences of the burden of proof between, uh, between intentional discrimination and disparate impact litigation. Redlining is, uh, you know, by the way, if, just as an anomaly, but everyone should know it, the, the phrase comes from the fact uh, that uh, in the early part of the 20th centuries, banks and insurance companies would take uh, maps of urban areas, take a red magic marker and draw red lines around certain neighborhoods where they would rather, where they would refuse to either lend money or to insure property. Um, and it was intentional policies uh, that were, were implemented, uh, very often documented policies uh, saying we will not do business uh, with communities of color or uh, with various uh, uh, vulnerable populations uh, in, in the community. Reverse redlining, as I said, is a relatively new notion, uh, at least uh, in uh, the late 20th century that came about. Um, and it's a uh, situation where, because of the fact that there is not equal access to credit and certain communities, particularly low-income communities and communities of color, have less access to credit than others, credit being an integral part of surviving in our, uh, our economy, uh, that subprime lenders and particularly predatory lenders, and I, I would distinguish between the two, uh, but uh, particularly predatory lenders would not draw a line around the neighborhood and say, we're not going to do business there. Rather, they would draw a line around the community and say, we're going to target that community. Uh, we're going to develop policies that ensure that the, uh, that the communities in which uh, the, this product uh, is being, uh, being distributed is far more common or far more likely to occur within the, the targeted communities. They're taking advantage of the vulnerability and the lack of access to credit in order to target those communities for credit for low costs. Thanks, Stuart. And uh, before we turn it over to Sarah, I just got to give a shout out to Liddell. Oh, and I'll turn it over to you, Gail, but Mapping Inequality, um, which is a, an amazing um, service to, to us. Um, Liddell, I don't know, we were just about to, to say a couple of words about that. Uh, not about mapping inequality, but I wanted to say on, um, you know, the Kianga Yamada Taylor, I'm a, a historian, like says, you know, like read this historian's book, the book Race for Profit by Kianga Yamada Taylor talks about this process from the 1960s and 1970s going forward. She terms like predatory inclusion, and it's like a similar um, kind of process of making resources like available in an exploitative fashion uh, that's kind of comparable to this um, um, more recent process of like re reverse redlining or you know like exploitative um, kind of credit credit instruments and finance um, so i just wanted to note that and the other was um, there's a book by a woman named marissa baradaran called the color of money which I think documents this in a very accessible fashion, um, the, the, the kind of inequality of the banking and financial system that I think the um, audience could, if, if they're interested in following up on either of these um, kind of concepts, um, reading interviews with Baradaran or um, Kiange Mata Taylor, or taking a look at both their books, Race for Profit and The Color of Money. Thanks, Liddell. Do you want to just give a quick um, description of mapping, again, inequality? It's just such a great resource. We're, we keep, we're talking about these red line maps, and you all have, have just done a great job of providing information on them and the maps themselves, and, and we're about two thirds or three quarters of them, right? Um, yeah, basically, in, the, uh, in response to the um, kind of housing crisis of the Great Depression. The Homeowners Loan Corporation was created as part of the New Deal and then kind of um, to, to kind of deal with the housing crisis or the emergency um, of the Great Depression. And the Federal Housing Administration was created to restructure the housing market. And these two agencies kind of worked to, together, right? They had some of the same economists and um, officials drawn from the private sector leaders in real estate in the 1920s and 1930s and um, surveyed local real estate developers, appraisers, lenders, and so forth, 
asking where where's a good neighborhood where's a bad neighborhood where do the wealthy people live where do the poor people live where are the single family homes where are the apartment districts and um kind of condense these synthesize these into um assessments both kind of um information sheets that they used in Washington DC, as well as these kind of well-known, kind of notorious color-coded maps. And um, the Homeowners Loan Corporation maps kind of stand in for this process of reshaping the expectations and the practices of um, the financial sector. FHA did this as well, but um, those those maps were destroyed in the late 1960s. So you can Google mapping inequality and find these maps that you've many of you have probably seen um, in um, like kind of journalistic coverage and so forth. Um, but it illustrates like these ideas came from the private sector, from academics, from real estate leaders, and then in the kind of opportune moment of um, like policy innovation and like new legislation were kind of institutionalized in federal federal agencies and then subsequently reshaped private practices based on right ideas that had kind of been in circulation among real estate and financial leaders in the 20s and 30s um, so you can see that this that these kind of biases of um, racial discrimination, as well as environmental injustice, were institutionalized, and we can kind of we have a lens for looking back at that and documenting um, longer term um, approaches. We cannot say that they're determinative for why an individual got a home mortgage or like why um, a single neighborhood was like demolished and redeveloped in urban renewal. But it gives us, I think, a very meaningful lens for cities uh, that had populations of 40,000 or above across the country um, in this moment of kind of reformulating. How do we even think about what home value is or um, should um, like people of separate races live in the in the same neighborhood, right? Like the real estate leader said, like, we do not want them. That will that will lead to lower property values. They were wrong, but that's the ideas that were institutionalized in um, in the Homeowners Loan Corporation, Federal Housing Administration, and kind of private sector um, practices. Thanks, Adele. Uh, Chanel? Yeah. <laughs> So I just wanted to talk to mention a couple things um, about uh, disparate impacts. So with disparate impacts in urban planning, us we practitioners um, look at uh, land use and environmental justice um, using geographic information tools. And it's something that's pretty easy and pretty handy for um, for folks to use or to get access to. Um, and it allows you to look at uh, the demographics, land use conditions, building conditions to really assess um, where things are happening. And so you do these analysis and it becomes very clear where there's uh, discrimination in a community, um, whether it's land use, transportation, um, you know, it paints a pretty vivid picture. Um, I wanted to go back to um, to one of the original points about kind of political action. Um, because we live in a democracy, nothing changes until the majority of folks actually are on board with change. Um, so I think that's something to to keep in mind. There are are places where um, you know there's a belief that you know this party is going to be anti-racist, this party is not doing the right thing, that party is, um, you know, against economic stuff. But unless there is um, unanimity that, um, that specific policies are good, those policies aren't gonna come into play. And I, I don't think um, there's, there is a political party that is, you know, awesome when it comes to <laughs> when it comes to uh, 
remedying, remedying redlining. Um, I also wanted to give a shout out to Andre Perry, um, Know Your Price. And it talks about gentrification and how, um, you know, the racial change in neighborhoods um, has driven African-Americans out of communities that were historically segregated and black. Um, and the forces that um, kind of like the new neighbors um, kind of have promulgated and making sure that every trace of, you know, black folks are being removed. Um, it starts with, oh, wow, I would love to live in a, a community with other people. It would be great. That's the first wave, right? Then prices increase. And by the third wave, wave of folks going in, you know, it becomes practically dangerous for somebody to sit on their stoop where they've lived for, for 30 years. So these are just a couple of the things that um, your students might be interested in, might want to talk about some more. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you, Charnel. And, and you know, I, I want to get back to the intentional uh, discrimination versus disparate impact in just a second. But Matt, I, I don't want to let it go yet because I know you have a lot to, to offer on this point. Um, thought, thoughts about this or how much emphasis has been placed on sort of the federal government's role in trying to remedy this and, and how to move forward? Sure. Um, you know, one interesting, so uh, since we're giving shout outs, there uh, was some recent research by a couple of historians named Trevor Logan and John Parman. Um, and this speaks to Rothstein's point about, you know, before FHA, we all lived in integrated urban neighborhoods. And what they've done is they've looked not at census tracts, but at actual kind of household data. And they found that between 1880 and 1940, segregation doubled in this country. And so this kind of speaks again to the larger patterns as we start building houses at a larger scale in larger groups, as cities start expanding, the territory starts expanding, there are all these new mechanisms available for kind of sorting ourselves out. Um, and so I think this is an important point to keep in mind. Um, <laughs> and then this is a, an adjacent point, actually, just switching gears, but I'm going to forget it if I don't mention it. I was also thinking when we were talking about disparate impact at, in, in the context of what Rothstein was saying about um, LIHTX uh, and uh, Section 8 vouchers and how they're, uh, uh, you know, we see clear disparate impacts. And I forget the name of the, I'm not a legal scholar and I, you'll have to forgive me, uh, law school students, for, for uh, <laughs> the name of a uh, case slipping my mind. But in Texas, uh, about 13 years ago or so, there was a, a major case brought by a civil rights group against the State Department of Housing that basically said the way you're letting lie texts kind of fall on the ground result, in, you know, it's reinforcing segregation and their problems kind of baked into the lie tech program. Uh, the cost of land is generally not, uh, uh, not covered. Um, and so developers, you know, it's a public private partnership and developers are trying to maximize the, the you know, the, the, the number of units they can build by choosing lower cost land, which meant you know, down by the tracks or down by the river um, or in historically disadvantaged neighborhoods. And, and um, changes were made in how the state uh, determines who can receive the lie tax. Uh, and it's had a, a, you know, a, a significant impact on how that works. And you know, New York, we're dealing with questions around uh, uh, policing, uh, 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 segregation against voucher holders, you know, so they're all, again, it's just a complicated, uh, complicated terrain. Um, but back to the sort of larger question about, you know, whether we're putting too much emphasis on federal policy. You know, again, you know, we see a longstanding pattern of segregation picking up speed that's a result of changing ways of allocating housing, producing housing, generating neighborhoods. Um, uh, I mentioned before the rise of private covenants and deed restrictions uh, starting in the 1890s. By the 1900s, 1910s, these were standard um, in middle class and upper middle class planned uh, developments. Uh, and it comes to FHA through developers who pioneered and popularized and insisted um, on these tools. 
Uh, we need to think about codes of ethics, right? In in uh, among realtors, uh, you know, Dale was talking about the 1920s and and uh, kind of lenders uh, uh, thinking about ways to discriminate. Well, uh, realtors too were thinking about ways to discriminate. And as uh, real estate agents become more of an important play, a more important role um, in kind of allocating housing and and managing housing distribution in American cities. Uh, they make a point of, of doubling down on discrimination and, and writing it into their code of ethics that no realtor shall sell uh, or lease a property to a member of a racial group, you know, that's not already kind of dominant in uh, in the neighborhood. Uh, you know, and again, and, and I mentioned this briefly before, but I'll mention it again just because it's something that I've worked on in my own work are you know, screening mechanisms um, in single family neighborhoods again, in uh, apartment buildings. I mean, I, I get calls today from developers who want to go into the co-housing business or co-living business, you know, these new kind of adult dorms that we see in, <laughs> in cities uh, that kind of emerged out in the wake of the, uh, you know, the economic recovery after the Great Recession. So, you know, 2014, 15, 16, we started to see these kinds of buildings going up in LA and New York and Chicago. You know, and developers call me and and sort of innocently ask what they can get away with in terms of discrimination. They're not thinking about racial discrimination, but they're thinking about creating community. Um, and so, uh, you know, this, this stuff is everywhere. I mean, you know, even in terms of uh, the way we sell private housing units in this country, where uh, you know, Australia they use auctions. Every everything's front and center. Um, here we allow everything to happen behind closed doors and. You know, in an effort to tamp down and to uh, on discrimination by agents, you know, we've seen this movement to discourage buyers from writing letters to sellers. You know, I have two kids and a family and I love your neighborhood and I love your house. Pick me, pick me of all these all cash offers that have come in. Um, you know, but again, this is just sort of another point at which discrimination is is allowed to happen because of a lack of uh, a lack of transparency. Uh, and then I know I'm talking too long, but a final point I, I, I want to add uh, that gives me pause ab about giving, uh, you know, too, emphasizing uh, uh, certainly the kind of federal uh, law too much is that it, while the, uh, the, the overall thrust of federal policy has been highly discriminatory since the New Deal, uh, there also have been counterforces within the federal government. I mean, even as early as the late 1930s, government uh, also became an important site, particularly in response to uh, the civil rights movement. Uh, government became a force for trying to break down some of these private barriers and just encountered serious headwinds at every turn. And, you know, the Fair Housing Act at this point, uh, well, first of all, you see their state fair housing acts in the 50s and 60s, uh, but even the federal one, this is what, 54 years ago, if uh, my math is correct. Uh, maybe, you know, is that yeah, something like that. Uh, you know, we celebrated the 50th anniversary a few years ago with a lot of retrospectives, certainly in, in the world of history. Um, and we see, you know, how little progress had, has been made. Again, because uh, there's so many opportunities in the private market to 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 uh, to derail uh, the forces of progress. Uh, so this is my uh, kind of Debbie Downer take on <laughs> on on uh, the role of of, of at least federal law in dismantling uh, things. Thanks, Matt. I, I just have a quick follow-up for you, but but before that, uh, just very quickly, folks are listening. It's a 2015 decision. It's the Texas Department of Housing and Community Affairs versus Inclusive Communities Project uh, is the case that you were mentioning. But Matt, I wanted to ask you just very quickly, uh, you know, everything that you mentioned, particularly around the, the COVID ethics, really resonated with me around like adaptation and climate change is happening. Do, do you, I mean, is this as much of what you're talking about, what we're going to see as the climate continues to change and, and communities of color are, are, are particularly impacted by, um, let's say, flooding or, or heat island effect and other things? Do, is this the same kind of thing we're going to see? Yeah, I mean, I mean, certainly not codes of ethics, but but all of the private legacies of unequal allocation of housing and racialization of neighborhoods. Absolutely, where we see, uh, you know, neighborhoods of color are envi on environmentally sensitive land by and large. Uh, we can look at patterns going back a century 
uh, in American cities. And again, it's, it's by the docks, it's by the river, it's on low-lying land. You look at a city uh, like Atlanta with its rolling terrain, the, 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 the hollows and the bottoms uh, historically were African-American, the hill sites um, were historically uh, white. Even when we have that much finer sort of grained pattern, there's still uh, uh, those uh, kind of environmental inequities uh, sort of baked into market allocation of of land and housing. And so we're seeing this, you know, certainly all around the world, and we're going to see it all around uh, the country uh, going forward. Uh, uh, a tr tremendous uh, uh, environmental costs being paid by communities of color. Anyone else want to weigh in on that before I finally get back to Sarah, or we finally get back to Sarah on the intentional uh, discrimination and disparate impact? Yeah, I, I want to weigh in on that. I mean, some of this if we look into the future, demographics um, will have a vote, right? Uh, and so um, kind of remedying racial discrimination is gonna have to happen in order for us to just continue having happy, peaceful lives. Um, going forward. I think that, you know, as there are more um, black and brown people in government, in positions of power, um, just in our communities, uh, there will have to be less, um, less discrimination, better laws, regulations. Um, we just can't keep on the same path and expect um, you know, expect to, to be going along good. Yeah. You know. uh, uh, anyone else on that point? Uh, I so hear from just the a reminder to, to, oh, sorry, Liddell, go ahead. I was going to say, I want to hear from the lawyers. <laughs> Um, just a reminder to those in the audience, please um, add your, there is already one question we have um, in the, the chat box. You can add it in the chat or the Q&A, um, and we'll get to those in just about five minutes. Uh, Sarah, please go ahead. Sure. Um, thanks. So we see redlining as primarily a disparate treatment claim. And disparate treatment requires evidence that a, the lender intentionally treated potential applicants differently because of the predominant race of the neighborhoods in which they live. Um, this theory does not require a showing of animus. We don't need to show that the bank president was out making racist statements and that's why they weren't lending there. And we don't get that kind of evidence anymore, right? So most of our evidence is circumstantial. Um, and that's why we look at where they locate their branches, where they're doing their marketing and outreach, um, who they're hiring to or not hiring to service minority areas. Um, disparate impact, on the other hand, is a theory that requires a specific facially neutral policy that has a disproportionate impact on a protected class. And we do use evidence of um, impact, which is our statistical evidence to support our claims, um, showing that the lender that we're, that we're looking at is not lending in, in the area that we're looking at. Um, but again, we need more than just the statistical evidence to support our claims. So we, we wouldn't bring um, a redlining case just on our statistical evidence. We need to have supporting circumstantial evidence that would support um, a treatment um, claim. And, and in our complaints, we're not required to plead which, which theory we're going on. We just plead a violation of the Fair Housing Act and ACOA. And um, we provide evidence in our complaints that would support both theories. Thanks, Sarah. Stuart, you've been so patient. Take it away. Yeah. No, I, I think that uh, Sarah gave a good description of the disparate impact. The, the key to the disparate impact, uh, though, uh, particularly as a private enforcement, is that uh, unusual in American jurisprudence, you don't have to prove knowledge or intent. Forget animus. You don't even have to prove knowledge or intent uh, on the part of the defendant. Uh, back in 1968 with the Fair Housing Act and the uh, ECOA a couple of years later uh, were enacted, it was after Title VI in the labor area. This idea of disparate impact was a notion that just merely eliminating intentional discrimination when you'd had hundreds of years of discriminatory behavior 
crafting or forming our society was not enough. And I like to have the analogy of a, of a running race uh, where uh, disparate treatment uh, cases is where you've got a running race and you've got two starting guns, uh, one for the white community and one for the uh, community of color. Um, you can say, no, we're gonna only have one starting gun. Everyone's gonna have the same starting gun. But if you've got a staggered start, the people who are starting behind are never going to quite catch up. And that's the what disparate impact is intended to get rid of. Not only the intentional discrimination, but the fact that anytime you have a policy which is neutral on its face and it's put into practice in a community that is segregated to begin with, that segregation will end up manifesting itself through the policy. Um, and whether or not that was the intention of the party when they adopted the policy, doesn't make any difference. What Congress decided in, in its more formative stages was that who is going to bear the burden of this discrepancy? And the answer is, uh, at least according to Congress, was that it's the, burden, it's the duty, if not the burden, uh, on the person who initiated the policy, the bank, the insurance company, the finance company, to ensure that when their policies are implemented, it does not have a disparate impact. We're not going to make the victims responsible for protecting themselves. Now, the fact that there's no intent requirement has made Courts get very squirrely. They're not used to it. They don't like the idea of signing someone, you know, uh, responsible for something that they did not intend. But that's the way the law uh, has been written and was uniformly applied uh, by every circuit court of appeal in this country. The curious thing about the ICP case that you referenced, Jonathan, uh, was the fact that when uh, that case was taken up by the Supreme Court, there was no problem. There, all 11 circuits agreed that you could have disparate impact claims, but the Supreme Court brought it up anyhow, which gave us some real pause why they were doing that. Uh, the compromise that came out, and Justice Kennedy wrote the, the decision on it, is that they affirmed what 11 circuits had already said. Yes, disparate impact is available under the Fair Housing Act, but as Sarah was just saying, you have to provide robust causation showing not merely the disparity, which by the way, I can prove in virtually every case, um, and a policy, which once again, I can probably prove in every case. My challenge is showing statistically that there's a robust causation that it was the policy that caused the disparity as opposed to anything else within society's norms uh, that are, are creating it. There's one other advantage that I just want to uh, throw out there that, that we've been using successfully at the National Consumer Law Center with our colleagues at the Legal Defense Fund and, and other uh, organizations, the ACLU, is the fact that uh, because you don't have to prove intent, one of the things that has really exacerbated the problem of disparate impact is the fact that uh, the folks that are the purveyors of subprime products very often are thinly capitalized. They don't have assets. Uh, you know, coming uh, out of their ears that they can use to perpetuate uh, these, these loans. But what we've seen in the last 20 years is that while Wall Street has securitized these, these loans, uh, these subprime loans, these predatory loans, um, they've basically taken what was a discriminatory system and put it on jet fuel with a virtually unending supply of funds in order to, to allow this reverse redlining to take place. What's great under the Fair Housing Act and the ECOA is that both statutes hold quite clearly under the regulatory as well as statutory interpretation uh, that a party that participates in the development of the investment scheme is equally liable and responsible, not vicariously, but has equal joint liability for the disparity impact litigation. So you're not only going after the bank that may go under or the small finance company that is engaging in these policies, but you can go after the major funder on Wall Street and say, the fact that you enabled this entity to engage in reverse redlining, you can be held responsible for that as well. And I have the advantages under those statutes, Sarah can talk about separately, I can seek damages there. And very often what we're seeking is disgorgement of the unjust enrichment that those entities were able to procure by targeting these communities uh, of low income and communities of color. Let's come back to those remedies in, in just a second, sort of what's available under each. Uh, what, Matthew? Yeah, I just had a quick question for Stuart and Sarah about non-bank lenders, uh, which have, you know, now, you know, they sort of came onto the scene when, like 15, 20 years ago, and now the majority of home loans aren't subject to kind of, or, or is that starting to change maybe? Um, I, I think I could handle that one to start. Um, uh, Matthew, you're absolutely absolutely right. Most of the mortgages these days are being made by non-bank lenders. And so we need to figure out how, how do we address redlining um, by those entities. And um, the attorney general um, announced in October um, a redlining initiative. 
and I don't know if any of you heard about this, but um, we have devoted a lot more resources since this new administration came on to trying to address redlining. And one of the, um, the major points of that is to look at non-bank lenders and see how, how we can focus on their lending also. Um, there are definitely other challenges that come with looking at a non-bank lender as a target of one of our investigations. Um, the bank lenders are regulated by uh, the supervisory agencies like the CFPB and the, um, the FDIC and the FRB. Um, and they're required to establish their assessment area pursuant to the Community Reinvestment Act. And the assessment area is the area in a metropolitan area that they say they will service. Um, and we used to see that lenders, brick and mortar lenders, would draw their assessment areas to intention to exclude the majority black areas of a jurisdiction. Um, we don't see that so much anymore. Now, most of our cases that we bring um, against lenders have to do with they're not servicing all portions of the assessment area that they have described that they would service. And so that's more common these days um, since banks have gotten smarter on that. But the non-bank lenders don't have to have an assessment area. So trying to figure out where are they servicing, what is the geographic area that we should look at when we're analyzing their lending is challenging, but is definitely something that we're focusing on. So just very quickly to respond back on that, what you have to do is you need to look at the definition of what a lender is under the Fair Housing Act under the ECOA, and it is a very broad definition and will encompass both banking and non-banking uh, lenders. As far as the non-banking lenders go, I, I just, I'm a, it's funny, it reminds me of the very old line that they, you know, they, they asked Willie Sutton, why do you rob banks? Uh, and his answer was, because that's where they keep the money. Uh, the answer is for the non-bank lenders, where are they getting their money from? And I think that if you dig deep enough, you find out their money is coming from investment firms, from investment banks, from Wall Street. Um, and as I said, under the ECOA and under the Fair Housing Act, they are lenders equally liable. You don't have to prove that they intended to discriminate uh, at all, but the mere fact that they participated in the scheme and facilitated it is enough to hold them responsible. And uh, I, you know, whenever we bring these cases, they're shocked. They're shocked to find out that we're holding responsible. They don't even know who the money is being loan loaned to. So how can you hold them responsible? And the answer is, is that's the way the statute is written and that they cannot bury their head in the sand, give money to these non-bank lenders and then close their eyes about how the money is being used. They're equally responsible and they have an affirmative responsibility to check and find out what it is it's, that the money is being used for. And if it's being used to create a disparate impact, then it's their responsibility to pull the plug on it. Otherwise, they'll be held liable. Um, and if I could just add one other challenge that we have with non-bank lenders is that um, they can open and close their lending offices without regulatory approval. Um, and they oftentimes, if, if we're going to come after them, and Stuart, I don't know if you have a similar experience, they will shut down the shop that they have and reestablish themselves somewhere else. And then we have the burden of showing that the, the new entity is a successor in interest, which is a, you know, a, whole, a whole challenge um, uh, under that scheme. So, so there definitely are more challenges in bringing cases against uh, these I, I agree. I mean, very often, you know, predatory lenders are, are not, you know, as I said, they're thinly capitalized. And you're right, they're very difficult. It's, it's like playing whack-a-mole uh, with them and trying to find as they, as they pop up. And that's why going upstream and finding the individuals who are funding it, forget cleaning up the, the mess on the floor, turn the spigot off at the, at the faucet to, to prevent it from growing is what we really need to be able to do. Uh, that is ideally we would like to be able to do, but as I said, there are limitations on what we can do in civil litigation in order to be able to impose that, but it is, I think, the best way that we can uh, to create changes in the marketplace. Matt? Yeah, just to, I, this isn't even a question and I don't, <laughs> uh, it's more just uh, to further emphasize the point that we need a multi-pronged approach to deal with redlining. Uh, I sort of alluded to this before, but it's worth just emphasizing uh, that a huge share of the housing market it doesn't involve mortgages at all, whether they're from banks or non-bank lenders. You know, New York City, historically, 50% of sales were all cash. 
Um, uh, and nationally, we're now up to 30%. I mean, that's unprecedented. Um, and obviously, this is uh, in part a function of, of you know, kind of multi, uh, you know, inherited multi-generational wealth and people who are already on the property market are, you know, are uh, benefiting from it in kind of extreme ways. I mean, there are all these interconnected problems, but, uh, you know, when we're thinking about solutions, uh, uh, given how many people are paying cash now, uh, we also need to, you know, think beyond regulating um, you know, Matt, just right. a follow up. Yeah, follow up on that, and that's absolutely true. What we're seeing as as bank money has dried up in terms of mortgages, we're doing cases, uh, land contracts, something that was around during you know the early 19th century have come back, or early 20th century. I'm sorry, have come back. Uh, uh, lease to own deals uh, out there, and uh, they may in fact violate the consumer laws. But in every single case, not only do they violate the consumer laws, I can almost guarantee they're also violating the civil rights laws. Absolutely. And I, I hate to, I don't want to give any props to Texas. Uh, this is the second time I'm invoking uh, that state, uh, which I otherwise find totally objectionable. Uh, but but uh, land contracts have been a particularly uh, a common form of financing in the colonious uh, down on the border, you know, half a million, mostly U.S. citizens living in basically shanty towns. Uh, uh, where they're paying for their land using contract for deed. Um, and Texas has actually been a leader in trying to bring some order and regulation to those kinds of land contracts. Stuart's uh, second to last comment, so not the one you just made, but the, last, the second to last one you made also touched upon remedies. And we have a question in the um, in the chat that that also gets to remedy. So let me read it and and you know you can all feel free to comment on it. It says thoughts about reparations to descendants of formerly enslaved African Americans due to the long lasting effects of redlining and the resulting loss of equity due to poor educational slash health slash care slash economic opportunities. Um, so I'll open that up to, to anybody. Um. I can start and just talk a little bit about the remedies in our cases. Um, you know, I, I think uh, Charnel had said at some point earlier that we all kind of have our, our small part to play in this. And I guess I just see the Department of Justice, the federal government's enforcement powers as one of those small parts to play. Um, but just to tell you a story about the first redlining case that I personally worked on and started investigating in 2008 in St. Louis. Um, and St. Louis is, um, has the largest percentage of, or at least at the time, had the largest percentage of unbanked um, Black residents in the country. Um, and it was, and it is highly segregated. Uh, and we looked at a bank there that was a local lender and all of its branches were in the majority white areas surrounding the majority Black areas in the city of St. Louis and Northern St. Louis County. Um, and when we looked at their lending, they lent to very few people in those majority Black areas. They also lent to very few Black individuals. So that's, that's where we started there. Um, we ended up settling with them. And one of the remedies that we got is we got them to open a branch in what had been a um, banking desert. The only credit that had been available to um, this area that was highly concentrated black population was payday lenders. So what do you ha what happens when you have payday lenders? If you take out a loan from them, the interest rate is crazy and people can't pay that interest loan and it ends up ruining people's credit. And so that's what that's what we were coming into there. And if people don't have good credit, then even under our programs, they wouldn't be allowed to borrow under federal underwriting standards. Um, so one of, the, one of the things we did is we had them open a branch in this area so that there was some credit available. Um, we had, an, and as a result of that branch um, in this area that had previously been blighted, um, there was a grocery store that followed it, a movie theater, um, and a whole bunch of other economic development that came after this bank came in. Um, we also, um, one of the programs we required them to do, in addition to what we call our loan subsidy program, so they need to subsidize loans, say down payment, offer down payment assistance to people who want to purchase and live in homes in the previously redlined areas. 
We also had them uh, working on credit improvement programs. So to offer um, credit education um, free of charge and offer also free um, um, checking and savings accounts that also had no minimum balance. So those are some of the things that we, we try to do to help the communities that had been previously redlined. And it's, you know, it's not reparations, but it's trying to put money back into those communities to so that the people who live there are able to build equity. And, you know, if they want to stay there, great. But as they're building equity, you know, they could take that equity, sell their house if they need to and move somewhere else. That's, that's up to them. Um, another program that we found that's very helpful for people in building equity is, is home improvement loans that are subsidized under our um, under our settlements. And this allows people who live in the affected communities to repair their roofs when they weren't able to do that before, or put in new plumbing. And um, a lot of those programs that, that we have helped to put together um, would be that somebody could have a home improvement loan for $5,000 and just pay the interest on that for three years. And if they can pay the interest on that for three years, the rest of the loan is, is forgiven. And the reason that, that we have put it together that way is because not only do they get the benefit of this home improvement loan, they also get the benefit of helping to improve their credit score. Because if they can make payments on just the interest, which is nominal, um, could be, you know, $5 a month, um, then, then they can help their own credit score. And we make sure that the lender does report those payments um, as a positive. Chana, thanks, Sarah. Chana? So I just want to go back to, I just want to touch on the reparations part of the question. Um, kind of goes back again to that political movement, political will, living in a democracy. Um, a lot of the laws that are in place that remedy historical discrimination have come through movements um, where there have been significant societal angst, agita, and prices to pay. So the, the question kind of comes to my mind, um, what would have to happen in order for the majority of Americans to support um, reparations in the in the redlining space. Um, I, I don't know what the answer is. <laughs> uh, I don't see that we're on a course for that to happen just through kind of like time and, and general goodwill. It's a really it raises a really great point. I don't know if any of you want to comment on this, right? But but it, it also highlights sort of the difference maybe between some of the remedies that Sarah's talking about and what Charnel's talking about, right? On one hand, we have uh, what we might call compensatory damages compelled through federal statutes with, to a private institution, what Sarah's talking about, versus what Charnel's talking about is about public reparations, something maybe like Evanston, Illinois, is one of the first local governments to institute reparations in housing, $25,000 for a, a variety of, of options there. Those are two very different ways to approach this. Uh, Shana, yeah. did you want I just, to? I just want to say that wasn't me saying reparations, let's go there. Um, oh, that was me just responding to um, what the student raised as the possibility of reparations coming into play. I don't see it happening. <laughs> oh, great. Well, now, but now, that we, now that you have the mic, what, tell me more about it. So would you go there? Oh. What I'm, what I'm saying is we live in a democracy. So what I, you know, Charnel only gets one vote, right? And until, until there, um, you know, there, there's only, if we look at the most recent, um, you know, movement that we had with Black Lives Matter, the cost was significant. The societal cost was significant. Um, and the reward is that there are more people who are enlightened or who are aware or who care a little bit. Um, I don't know what would have to happen for reparations to, to, be, a popu to be popular among the electorate, um, but I would imagine that it would be a significant, it would have to be, it didn't happen with George Floyd, 
it would have to be worse, I guess. I, but I don't see it happening. Yeah, that's a great, great point. Thank you, Chanel. Uh, others, yeah, Matt? Yeah, I mean, I, it's, I, I have to, uh, Charnel makes an excellent point. I mean, in theory, reparations is a, a wonderful idea, but the place where we see it happening and where I think, um, at least in the short and medium term, likely to continue to happen is at basically the municipal level, perhaps maybe at the state level. Uh, but $25,000 to black homeowners in Evanston or, uh, you know, the repatriation of that property in Santa Monica, that's not quite uh, the same thing. You know, these programs are, are, are wonderful, but they're hardly transformative. Um, and then I was also glad that uh, Sarah uh, was talking about those kind of remediative programs, uh, because it's, you know, worth mentioning that uh, many, many studies have shown that uh, uh, sort of creative first-time homeownership programs, well managed, are hugely effective, um, and, and I think this is a, 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 an incredibly important area in which all levels of government um, uh, can become more involved. Again, you know, it's fighting a beast with a toothpick, but um, it is an effective toothpick. I'll say I'm I'm a little bit more optimistic about. Um, the like potential of reparations um, that that I like have been in any point in my life thus far. That is to say that there is like b b you know in my youth I felt like it was like verboten like that was simply not a topic of serious conversation. Now we see like extremely modest and extremely local um like dis discussions or implementations of programs like but that's unbelievable progress and in my mind right like um my mind of political transfer my, my model of political transformation is not like imposition by like a president it's essentially the percolation of like many local um initiatives that like build to state level and then um potentially come to federal level. I don't think that they're, I don't know what the right um, mode or like form of reparative program is. And I think actually whatever is politically like kind of um, like palatable, like needs to be discovered through kind of multiple modes of experimentation, right? Like when um, the, the community and um, Evanston, the policymakers use the redlining maps as like the basis for their um, kind of boundary setting. And when that passed, I was like, this is unbelievable. And I don't know that that's going to have like a significant effect, but then like Asheville, North Carolina, then um, the city of San Francisco begin talking about this and probably come up with maybe a, a more locally appropriate and potentially more scalable um, type of um, type of program that, you know, like then has like savvy political uh, kind of mobilize, uh, um, mobilizers behind it and, you know, potentially could lead to some more um, effective and more um, kind of politically viable program or set of programs. And so the extremely modest um, programs that we have seen up to this point, I think is, um, you know, first light years from what we had under discussion 20 and 30 years ago. And I think can like lead to like more progress on this. And I, I see that as like, like meaningful steps towards some ultimate goal of um like remediating like the the kind of loss of wealth or the like th the theft of wealth from redlining from contract sales and the kind of products of racial racial segregation and housing thanks to dale um as someone noted in the in the chat box um in california as well as others have a uh, uh California's is the first in the nation, as was mentioned in our reparations task force, and others are talking about it as well, to Dale's point. There is a question in the chat box which follows up on this, and it says, um, 
Why do reparations have to be subject to the popular vote opinion? It flows from a government sanction wrong and should start there by putting it on the people. We allow the government to escape liability and action to remedy it. Uh, the the um, comment goes on to talk about school segregation uh, and how that was remedied. And does anyone have any thoughts on that? So I just want to clarify. So my viewpoint just comes on like I, in my experience, I just don't have a lot of point, you know, data points for being optimistic. So don't, <laughs> um, you know, I get surprised when, um, I get surprised when I walk into a meeting and I'm not the only black person in the room. So, um, so don't, you know, good things can, uh, can in fact, happen so I just didn't I just wanted to clarify that yeah right on Shannon uh, uh, other other points on that I, I was just going to say very quickly I, I the question was directed towards uh, government responsibility and that that hasn't been uh, you know the approach that, that we've had although uh, certainly um, if you look back and, and sorry you might be able to comment more on this if you look back particularly in the uh, Clinton administration, uh, that um, that the Justice Department began to use disparate impact litigation to go after municipal and county entities. Long Beach was one, if I recall correctly, sorry, where they went and to, to force the changes uh, through uh, disparate impact litigation. It, you know, I certainly don't think that it is equally the same when you go after the financial institutions. And I can't say that I've been all that successful yet, but it's just a model that follows along the same line is going after the, the enablers, the ones that created the resources that allowed the disparities to, to not only exist, but to persist and to force them to disgorge the uh, unjust enrichment that they were able to obtain through it in order to return to the communities that were exploited is one of the ways uh, that, that we, we are, uh, trying to highlight the issue and trying to to remedy it. It's not the sole issue, and certainly not the most effective one yet. Uh, but it is at least one example of trying to get to the, the profits back into the hands of the people who were entitled to them in the first place. Thank you, Stuart. So we have uh, just about seven minutes or so left, and I thought I'd give at least of you a minute to to kind of throw a parting shot out there or a question or comment out there that you want um, people to, to sort of remember and take away from this. And yeah, Liddell, kick us off. Thank you. Um, you know, because of the work on mapping inequality, um, I get asked to um, talk to like make presentations to corporations, to college classes, and to community groups all the time and like it always comes back to people people some they say what can i do so you know i was talking to a um financier and they said you know like what how can we how can we like kind of counter redlining you know like as how can i do this as a loan officer i'm like listen when the application gets to your you know like desk right like basically they're kind of bound to follow the best practices of the industry right that essentially um an individual working within you know they're kind of right you're bound by the standards of your profession but what i say to them is where you can have an impact is to change the standards of the profession and so i emphasize working within these professional organizations when i said that model of kind of like political um, building from grassroots and kind of percolating up, you know, like all of these kind of discriminatory practices started, you know, like with 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 small, small practices or individuals that then worked to get them institutionalized, whether we're talking about um, racial covenants, whether we're talking about Hulk redlining, and whether we're talking about um, this kind of like predatory inclusion and reverse redlining. And so, you know, for the lawyers, the law students in the in office, right, like, you're going to get a job, you know, maybe you start your own firm, you work for another firm, and you're going to kind of like take the cases, right. And, you know, we've talked about like, you've got to meet this standard, you've got to meet this standard. But I think that there's like, un 
like unbelievable opportunities to be involved and to kind of like drive these conversations to alter best practices within these organizations, whether it be like the ABA or, um, you know, like state kind of like planning organizations that write the standards that advise and lobby um, state legislators for example. And so we need to think of ourselves for law students, like not merely as lawyers who are going to just try the cases, but also like legally informed professionals who have a great deal of, I think, like kind of cultural power and authority to shift the conversation and to um, work through these professional organizations um, to to change how we even think about like what counts as a best practice, what counts as like discriminatory and segregationist or acceptable and race neutral um, policy. And so I, we need to, th I, I hope all of the law students um, listening will kind of realize not merely like what kind of job do you want for your career, but like what kind of impact do you ha ha wanna have in your profession or your society? Great, thanks, Miguel. Uh, if we'll go right around my screen, if that's all right with you, unless someone else wants to go second. Take it away, Sarah. Okay, so in limiting my comments to the stated topic of this um, seminar, of remedying redlining, um, from our perspective, lenders know what they're doing. And they, they have the same information that we have. And they are still avoiding lending in majority Black and Hispanic census tracts throughout the country. And when we bring our enforcement actions, they're against lenders. They're not against other government entities, um, which has been a lot of the topics here of how do we remedy for government actions here. Um, they're, against, they're against lenders. But the intention largely of our actions is also to inform the, the uh, industry of and remind them that they need to they need to lend in these communities. They can't avoid lending because it's going to cost them. And that's that's really the point of our recent redlining initiative that we're taking resources throughout the federal government um, and and putting them towards uh, remedying redlining. Thanks, Sarah. Great. Uh, Matt? Well, I have nothing to add after Dale. That was, um, uh, <laughs> you expressed far more succinctly a lot of uh, inchoate thoughts um, in my mind. Uh, we just needed, you know, and, and, and just to build on, on um, your comments, um, and to circle back to an example that we've talked a little bit about before, I mean, look at the movement towards uh, ab abolishment of single family zoning. I mean, this is something that is happening in communities um, uh, in, in sometimes in unexpected ways. It's coming from the YIMBYs as, as well as uh, civil rights activists. Uh, but there is a conversation that's happening at the grassroots level that um, is modeling change. And we're seeing cities change their laws and now states, including New York, um, are talking about amending their laws. Um, and so uh, maybe your uh, optimism is infectious. Thanks, Matt. Sharna? Yeah, I just, um, you know, so happy to be here today. And a lot of your students are gonna be making a big, you know, big differences in the world. Um, and I hope that as, as you um, go through and develop your career, that you um, look around and see who you can bring along with you. I think that having diversity in the profession, um, trying to be, you know, I know in my company, my, my thing is I'm gonna try and be a little less racist, like myself. <laughs> um, we have uh, 24 people, we have seven languages, seven or eight, eight languages among our group, just by being intentional about being inclusive to get other viewpoints, to get other perspectives. And it really makes a huge difference. Fantastic. Uh, and last but not least, Stuart, bring us, bring us home. Yeah, with two, exactly at two o'clock, I'm gonna be very short. And look, uh, we didn't get into this mess overnight and it's not gonna be resolved uh, overnight either. 
I think the lesson that you hear from today is that it's not really that we're facing a significant problem with access to credit, whether it be redlining or reverse redlining, but there are lots of different approaches in which to, to, uh, to attack it. Um, and the fact that it takes time should not dissuade us from fighting that battle. We may not be able to complete or win the final battle ourselves, but we are not excused from at least trying and starting it as well. There is a role for all of us to play in order to, to ensuring fairness in the marketplace. And whatever way that the students or the, the lawyers online here uh, find that it is their strength, go out. We need all of you from all of your different angles in order to be able to approach this. Uh, and together we will ultimately succeed. Before I turn it back to Connor, I just wanna say thank you all. Uh, it really has been a pleasure. Uh, and thank you for taking the time with us this afternoon. Connor? Yeah, thank you, Professor. This was fantastic. Uh, I want to thank uh, everyone for joining us today. Uh, and then a special thank you, obviously, to the panelists and to our moderator. Uh, you guys all did a great job. And then and thank you for taking two and a half hours out of your busy lives to be with us today. I know personally how busy all of you are. So I, I really, from the bottom of my heart, I do thank you tremendously for being here. Um, I thought today this was both thought provoking and engaging. Uh, so Thank you again. And um, I do want to, before I sign off, I do want to know we did record this. So I had a couple questions for people about uh, if this would be recorded. We did. Uh, once I get a link for that, I will send it out to those who, who asked about that. So if others want to uh, watch the recording, they can do so. So uh, without further ado, I'll uh, sign everyone off. Thank you again uh, for joining us today. And uh, everyone have a great day. Yeah.